Where's video? Lebowski. Where's video? Lebowski. Where's the fucking video? Shithead! Oh, it's uh, oh, oh, it's down there somewhere. Let me take another look. So, where was I? Welcome back to my critique of season eight of Game of Thrones. If you haven't seen part one, I recommend watching that first. I'm not going to waste too much time before jumping back into the critique, but there are a few things I quickly want to cover. Firstly, a big thank you to everyone that watched and responded to part one. I made a couple of mistakes that a few of you pointed out, and I'll try to avoid those in the future. There have been some people that liked the season and think I was too harsh. Hear me and hear me good in person. I'm here to double down. That shit is a, a two pack of ass. Some people question the efficacy of keeping the soldiers behind the walls of Winterfell and engaging in siege warfare with the army of the dead. And while I'm certainly no expert, that just seemed preferable to lining the entire army up outside the walls of the castle and directly in the path of certain death. Even characters from previous seasons of the show have made that very point. A smart commander does not abandon a defensive advantage. As long as we stay behind these walls, they can't touch us. Not to mention that the snow is so deep we couldn't get an army through to engage them even if we wanted to. Kind of forgot it. There were also a few people that got weirdly political about part one of my critique, particularly in my reference to Donald Trump when making an analogy about real independence and the quasi-independence Sansa gets for the North at the end of the show. I thought it should have been clear I only used a clip of Trump because I was directly referencing the presidency and Trump is the sitting president. If someone else were the sitting president, I would have used a clip of them. And some people question the analogy itself, in which I compared the independence the US and Australia have from England. I thought the point was decent, particularly since I was relating it to Sansa asking for the North's independence in the finale, rather than them earning it directly. Perhaps some people couldn't look past their own political biases, or perhaps the analogy was a weak one. Regardless, I hope it's clear going forward that when I use analogies like that, that's all they're intended to be. Analogies. Now that I've covered that, let's actually discuss what we came here to discuss. Game of Thrones. This part of the critique will cover episode 4, The Last of the Starks, and episode 5, The Bells, while part 3 will cover the finale. And in case it wasn't obvious, I will be thoroughly spoiling these episodes and the series as a whole as I break them down scene by scene. If you don't want spoilers, or are upset that I've included them, don't worry. I didn't spoil the show. The writers did. And now, without any further ado, let's begin the critique. They ended it brilliantly, better than I could have imagined, and uh, you people are in for it. <laughs> Episode 4 opens with a large funeral, where the living burn the dead on pyres. We see Jorah and Theon's dead bodies, and we see Daenerys and Sansa mourn them. I covered the failure of their deaths in part 1, but I must reiterate that this moment would hold much more weight if their deaths hadn't been written in such an illogical way. During the edit, I thought of something else that makes Theon's character arc even less satisfying than I had previously thought. I mentioned in a previous video that it should have been Theon that killed Ramsay rather than Sansa, and that while Sansa was treated poorly by Ramsay, Theon spent three entire seasons being tortured and tormented by him, and that Theon killing Ramsay would have been more satisfying. Well, whilst I was editing this section, I remembered this scene. Lord Stark went out of his way to make it your home. Yes, my captors were so very kind to me. You love reminding me of that. Everyone in this frozen pile of shit has always loved reminding me of that. You know what it's like to be told how lucky you are to be someone's prisoner? To be told how much you owe them? It's arguably the best original dialogue that Benioff and Weiss wrote for the series, and it's likely Theon's best. But there is one line of dialogue that suddenly stuck out to me in the context of Theon's character arc. I will kill that man. I don't care how many arrows they feather me with, how many spears they run through me, I will kill that horn-blowing cunt before I fall. The horn-blowing cunt is in fact Ramsay Snow. In the first scene that Ramsay is in, more or less, Theon promises to kill him. Over the next three seasons, Ramsay tortures, disfigures, mutilates, and ultimately breaks Theon, rendering him a husk of his former, confident self. Imagine the payoff if Theon, having redeemed himself for his betrayal of the Starks, by bravely rescuing Sansa, was the one to kill Ramsay. Instead of a flashy battle between Jon and Ramsay ending with a flashy death with his hounds, imagine if Theon had managed to sneak back into the castle on the eve of the battle and quietly exact his revenge on Ramsay in the dead of night. Perhaps even castrating Ramsay before killing him? It would have paid off both the three preceding seasons of torture 
and it would have paid off this scene from all the way back in season 2. Then you could have Theon sacrifice himself to save Bran and have him die after the Night King has been killed. So he knows his last act was to save Bran. Sansa, Arya and Bran could be there with him as he dies, with Sansa telling him he is a Stark. Instead we got this. Anyway, let's get back to it. I doubt anyone imagined Jorah being killed by nameless whites when the series first started nearly a decade ago. Who could have imagined this would be his fate when we were first introduced to him? The same can be said for Theon. Given all that he has overcome and endured, for him to die thinking he failed to protect Bran seems like something of a failure to pay off his arc. I actually received a couple of comments on part 1 saying that Arya killing the Night King didn't need to be set up because the army of the dead posed a threat to everyone, and thus posed a threat to Arya, so it made sense she would want them dead. My point with regard to the lack of setup for her to be the one to pull the trigger, or dagger, was that it was incredibly lazy writing. This is especially true given all the setup for a confrontation between the Night King and Jon, a confrontation that never occurs. The opposition to this point argued that it seems set up for Rob to kill Joffrey and take the throne to avenge his father, Ned's death, but that didn't happen, so therefore it's okay that the fight between the Night King and Jon doesn't happen, and that Arya kills the Night King. The response to this should be obvious. The death of Rob was set up as far back as the first season finale. You will marry one of his daughters. Whichever you prefer. Do you consent? Can I refuse? Not if you want to cross. Then I consent. You already swore me one oath right here in my castle. You swore by all the gods your son would marry my daughter! And his demise and failure to avenge his father made sense from both a character and story point of view. And this is true of the multiple characters that were involved. Rob's death and the Red Wedding as a whole is actually evidence of how you can subvert expectations while simultaneously paying off multiple character arcs. Conversely, Arya killing the Night King doesn't pay off anything. There was no setup for her to be the one, when something as simple as her training in the House of Black and White could have been tailored to fit this purpose. And failing to pay off the confrontation between Jon and the Night King doesn't reward the viewer at all. There's no intricately woven story beat or character payoff here. It's just a lazily written twist that required retconning previous scenes. Brown eyes. Blue eyes. Green eyes. Brown eyes. Green eyes. And blue eyes. So we get a quick look at the funeral and we can see what looks like a series of pyres with bodies on them. The pyres run 10 long by 10 wide and based on some close-ups we see have approximately 10 bodies on each which means there's a hundred pyres holding a total of a thousand bodies. Actually, during the editing process, I noticed that my initial estimation of 10 bodies per pyre was wrong. Based on this shot, it actually looks like approximately 25 bodies per pyre. Those pyres are in 10 rows of 10, with an additional row of 10 pyres with approximately 10 bodies on each for the important dead people. So that would be somewhere between 2,500 and 2,600 dead bodies, not 1,000 as I initially estimated. It's still not 100,000 though, is it? Given that half the army of the living is claimed to have been killed and the entire army of the dead was killed, there should be well over 100,000 bodies on the pyres. It's almost like attention to detail doesn't matter anymore. But remember, if things like that bother you, you're probably just watching the show wrong or something. Hold on a second, is that a bunch of Dothraki? But I thought they all got killed in that really dumb but visually impressive move from the previous episode. I guess a few of them survived. How far gone? Wait, what? What do you mean half survived? Then what was the point of this? And why didn't we see much of the Dothraki for the remainder of the battle? This is what I mean about lazy writing. The writers clearly wanted a grand visual to open the battle in episode 3, and they needed an easy way to get rid of the Dothraki. It was cheap, especially given how much time the show has spent building the Dothraki up, but I could at least somewhat understand it, but now they've decided they need the Dothraki back to bolster Daenerys' army for her invasion of King's Landing, so magically the Dothraki are back. Earlier they were retconning scenes from five seasons ago, now they're doing it from the previous episode. We then see a huge feast and celebration amongst the living. I guess given that half of the soldiers were killed, the problem of a food shortage just kind of solved itself. Danny then makes Gendry the Lord of Storm's End and legitimizes him as a Baratheon, son of King Robert. This is a very nice moment for Gendry, although I'm still not happy with characters just being handed huge moments for their arcs rather than directly earning them. But that aside, it is a nice payoff for Gendry. 
Unfortunately, it doesn't make any sense. Firstly, we just have to assume that the people of Storm's End are going to accept a bastard they've never met as their new lord. But putting that aside, by legitimizing Gendry, Danny has in fact given him a claim to the Iron Throne. He is now the only living son of a previous king, and arguably has as good a claim to the throne as Danny. Now obviously he doesn't have an army, so he has no real way of claiming the throne, although that raises questions about how he will keep Storm's End. And if he were to suddenly stake his claim to the throne, he runs the risk of Danny killing him. Actually, that might have been a decent step towards turning her into the Mad Queen. If we take the events that happened, i.e. Danny turning into the Mad Queen, and we keep those events, but rewrite the show to make it make sense, and give the events the time required to make them make sense, then Gendry betraying Danny and staking his claim to the Iron Throne after she legitimizes him could be interesting. Let's say Danny isn't going to go mental for a couple more seasons. Gendry could spend that time building an army and eventually challenge her claim to the throne, or he could even do it straight away without having an army at his back. This would then put Danny in a morally grey area. Gendry would pose no direct threat, but he would be challenging her legitimacy as queen. Her advisors would tell her to offer him more land and titles to make him go away, but she could ultimately choose to kill him herself, making the situation a philosophical conundrum for her, with a morally ambiguous resolution. And she would be getting her hands dirty in the process. It would be a step in the gradual development of the Mad Queen. It's not an outright evil act straight out of the gate. It's the first step in a long line of them that eventually lead her to this point. Instead, she goes from zero to mental in one episode. By the way, during this scene, Danny actually asks if anyone knows who the Lord of Storm's End is, and no one does. So who's Lord of Storm's End now? I don't know, Your Grace. Does anyone? That's basically the writing of this season in a nutshell. It reminds me of the mysterious Dornish prince that just materialises in the finale. And yes, this is where the infamous Starbucks cup is seen. I can't imagine how something so obvious and out in the open was missed, especially given how huge this production was, but there you go. Given the abject destruction of multiple characters this season that we have followed since episode 1, this is a relatively minor error, but worth pointing out nonetheless. It's similar, if less egregious, to Arya jumping out of literal nowhere when she attacks the Night King. It's easy to understand how something like this could happen, but it shows a lack of care for the overall product. Tyrion tells Danny that her decision with Gendry was clever, as he will always be loyal. This almost seems like the writers are self-aware at how stupid this decision actually is, and are directly telling the audience that it's smart and not to question it. Show Don't Tell is writing 101, but even the basics are ignored from this point on. It makes sense because we said so. Danny embarrassingly responds by saying Tyrion isn't the only one who's clever. This actually makes a certain kind of sense as Tyrion has been a complete idiot for several seasons now. So Danny making a dumb decision and then comparing her intelligence to Tyrion's is inadvertently bang on. Tormund praises Jon for his fighting skills in the battle. This seems to visibly anger Danny as she is getting little praise. Tormund says only a madman or a king rides a dragon in a rather on the nose way of expressing that the people see Jon as king and not Daenerys as queen. This is another example of the writers telling and not showing. Instead of us seeing the people from Danny's perspective celebrate Jon, we need Tormund to tell Jon that he is the king in front of Danny. Varys appears to notice Danny's anger in what is a rushed setup for an incredibly rushed path to his betrayal, and Danny's culmination as the Mad Queen. Up to this point, Varys has been loyal to Danny more than any other. He teleported all over the place in season 6 to bring her forces and the Dornish army together, ready for her invasion of Westeros. But he catches one glimpse of her in a shitty mood and suddenly he's a fair-weather fan ready to throw his lot in with Jon. Why couldn't this have been gradually built up over the space of several seasons? I've only read the first book so far. Fuck books. Oh, no, books are no, for no, pussies. No, 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 no. Go hit the gym. But from what I gather, season 5 essentially adapted the major moments from books 4 and 5. And season 6 finished off the moments that were missed like the King's Moot. And I know that books 4 and 5 take place at roughly the same time and are simply divided by location. Given that book 3 had enough material to cover seasons 3 and 4, I think it likely stands to reason that books 4 and 5 had enough material to cover seasons 5 through 8 if adapted fully without skipping over sections and cutting some sections out entirely. And given there's another 2 books still to come, I think it's fair to say that this show could have run for around 12 seasons. We could have gone to 11, 12, 13 seasons, but uh, they, I guess they wanted a life. Well, it, it, you know, if you've read my novels... You, you know there was enough material for, for more seasons. So why didn't the writers take their time? Danny could have been gradually built up to becoming the Mad Queen over the next couple of seasons. 
and even become the main villain of the final season or two if they wanted. Instead, it was rushed so much that most of the supporting characters have to act completely out of character. Varus is no different. Tyrion, Jamie, and Brienne play the drinking game. Brienne brings up Tyrion's first marriage as a way for the writers to give the viewers that were upset over the lack of the Taisha reveal back in season 4 a giant middle finger. As I mentioned earlier, I haven't read all of the books, but I know the reveal about Tyrion's first wife at the end of book 3. I actually attribute the writers cutting the reveal about his wife out of the scene where Jaime frees Tyrion from prison, and the scene where Tyrion kills Tywin in the fourth season finale as the moment the show fell apart. It's such a brilliant moment for the characters, particularly Tyrion, that to cut it out makes no sense. And then the writers tease mentioning it again here as some sort of fuck you to the audience. They do it again in the next episode, but we'll get to that. Tyrion then claims Brienne as a virgin, as if this is some sort of revelation. This should be obvious. Obvious to the point I doubt Tyrion would realistically bring it up. Brienne is an unmarried lady in a feudal era. Of course she is. She's not a prostitute. Outside of being raped, which she hasn't been, it would just be assumed. Brienne leaves and Tormund goes to follow her, but gets cucked by Jaime. Sansa sees the Hound spurn a woman trying to sleep with him and says she would have made him happy. The Hound replies there's only one thing that will make him happy. The implication here is he means killing his brother, the Mountain. Now, let's stop and talk about Clegane Bowl and the hype surrounding it. I'll get more into detail on this when we come to the scene itself, but I want to talk briefly about the hype and the in-show build-up for this moment. I've mentioned before, and will continue to do so as we finish out this critique, that much of the story and character beats of Season 8, and arguably the second half of the show in general, are rushed, without proper care, attention, and time being taken to truly make the moment work. And I think, for all its hype, Clegane Bowl makes that list. The fight between brothers Sandor and Gregor Clegane has been anticipated for a long time, and yet there has been very little actual build-up to it in show. In the first season, they have a brief fight, but that was the Hound defending Loras Tyrell from the Mountain's attack after the Night of the Flowers defeated Gregor in Jousting. If the Hound had wanted to kill his brother more than anything, then surely this was a perfect time to do it. But the second King Robert gives the order to stop, the Hound complies. His service to the King trumps his desire for revenge. After this moment, the characters don't meet again until the seventh season finale. In that time, the Hound has not mentioned his brother, and there has been no indication that he desperately wants revenge. After all, he could have taken it at any time after season two, when he quit working for King Joffrey. Throughout seasons three and four, he is wandering the Riverlands and the Vale with Arya, and could have stopped and gone directly after his brother. Instead, rather fittingly for his character, he chose to protect Arya and focus on making money over his apparent desire for revenge. And after season 4, when Arya leaves him for dead, he is found and rescued by a commune that rehabilitates him. He gives up his life of violence and settles for a quiet life. But when the writers decide they want to bring him back into the main story, this character development is thrown out. And back comes the violent and bloodthirsty Hound of old. And yet still he doesn't go after his brother. Instead, he agrees to help the North go beyond the Wall. It's only when he accompanies Jon and Daenerys to King's Landing to parley with Cersei that we get a scene between the Hound and the Mountain. And it's clear that Sandor can tell the Mountain is no longer the same man he once knew as his brother. And yet still he makes no attempt to kill him or engage him. In fact, the Hound noticing that his brother is nothing more than a rotting zombie actually explains why he wouldn't want revenge on him. Because he is no longer the same man that burned his face as a child. That was a very long-winded way of explaining that the Hound's sudden desire for revenge is a rushed retcon. Even if it does make sense that he'd want revenge for his burned face, the fact he's shown no real desire for revenge until now, coupled with the fact that he clearly knows his brother is basically dead already, makes this a forced bit of plotting and shoehorned character beat by the writers. I imagine they thought that Clegane Bowl would earn them some goodwill from the fans and provide them an easy out to kill both the Hound and the Mountain, and didn't think much beyond that. The Hound then tells Sansa that he heard Ramsay raped her. This is odd for several reasons. Firstly, I doubt Sansa has really been going around telling people she was raped. Maybe it became common knowledge that she and Ramsay were sleeping together at Winterfell while he was there, but given that Ramsay's men are all dead, I doubt any of them told the Hound. But secondly, it's odd that people would just assume she was raped. Sansa and Ramsay were married, and even someone as young and innocent as Sansa at the time must have known that husbands and wives sleep together. Hell, her family even does a betting ceremony at weddings. She knew the score. Now the show makes it rather clear that Ramsay rapes her, and it is certainly fitting of his character. But in a feudal era, why would this just be assumed? Especially between a newlywed couple. And you might think that the people would assume this based on Ramsay's reputation. But Littlefinger's explanation for leaving Sansa with the Boltons was that he didn't know about Ramsay's nature. This really just highlights how illogical it was that Littlefinger would agree to marry her off to Ramsay in the first place, and how dumb it is to imagine that Sansa would agree to it. She had no choice when it came to marrying Tyrion. She was a prisoner of the Lannisters. But with Ramsay, she was free and under Littlefinger's protection. 
That story was all so dumb. Regardless, it just seems odd that it would be common knowledge that Ramsay raped Sansa. Who is spreading this information? The Hound says if she had left King's Landing with him at the end of Season 2, then none of this would have happened to her. Sansa agrees, but says without it happening to her, she would still be a little bird. I have plenty of issues with the character of Sansa, mostly how incredibly disappointing she turned out to be. I always imagined it would be rather fascinating to watch the character turn from a scared and stupid little girl to a master manipulator playing the Game of Thrones. But the truth is, she never really played the Game of Thrones, and we never saw her transform from the scared little girl to the intellectual mastermind. Instead, the series just told us that's what she became and expected us to agree. Think about it. At the end of the fourth season, it is implied that Sansa is finally going to start playing the game. And I was genuinely excited to see where the character would go from there. Then in season five, they walk her character back and she becomes a scared little girl being abused by Ramsay. At the end of the season, she and Theon escape. And in season six, she aids Jon in the planned attack on Winterfell. She contacts Littlefinger, asking for help in the battle via the Vale army, and pointlessly keeps this fact from Jon, nearly leading to his death and the loss of the battle. Then she kills Ramsay, and the show acts as though she accomplished anything when it was Littlefinger that really saved the day. She repays him by having him killed at the end of the seventh season in another we told you it happened this way so it just did type of scene, which made absolutely no sense. It was the epitome of a shut your brain off moment and one of the worst moments in the entire show. And then at the end of season eight, she is handed the North's independence by Bran and becomes queen in the North. She doesn't actually do much of anything. She never really plays the game. All of her accomplishments are either handed to her or are actually other people's accomplishments. And all the while, other characters are telling us how brilliant she is. The smartest person I've ever met. You. It's a real shame because something truly brilliant could have been done with the character of Sansa, especially in contrast to her sister Arya's story. Instead, she became a supporting character in everyone else's stories, and then the writers just pretended she was some brilliant mastermind. I imagine the writers simply had no idea how to actually incorporate her in the game, or worse still, they thought they were incorporating her in the game. Either way, Sansa is just one in a long line of missed opportunities. Gendry then finds Arya pointlessly firing arrows and tells her that he is no longer Gendry Rivers, he is now Gendry Baratheon, the Lord of Storm's End. He then proposes marriage to Arya, who of course rejects him. We'll get to the stupidity of the proposal in a second, but let's first talk about Arya's rejection. It was obvious immediately she was going to turn him down. Whether that was the writers wanting to stay true to her adventurous spirit, or some attempt to reinforce feminist stereotypes regarding marriage, I'm not sure. Regardless, her rejection was never in question. And yet, it would have been rather satisfying and interesting if she had said yes. Think about the contrasting character arcs we could have had between Sansa and Arya. Arya starts off as a rebellious child swearing off conventional life, while Sansa dreams of marriage and children. Then throughout the show, Sansa gradually begins to play the Game of Thrones and has little time for family life, whilst Arya's travels take her from makeshift family to makeshift family and finally back home. With the goal of her adventures complete, she finally allows herself time for love and family. Much of this show, and particularly this season, as well as many tentpole franchises lately, have prided themselves on subverting expectations, and this would have been the ultimate subversion of Arya's character, while still being thematically consistent. But I guess her going off to find the eastern coast of Essos was more of a subversion. Now let's quickly cover the proposal itself. Gendry proposed. That really should be all I need to say. The stupidity of that should be self-evident. This is a feudal system. People don't propose. And certainly not highborn people. They are betrothed. That's how Ned's brother was engaged to Catelyn and why Ned took his place after his death as a matter of honour. Rob's betrothal to one of Walder Frey's daughters and the subsequent breaking of that betrothal led to his death. And Arya herself was even betrothed to a Frey in the same scene. The proposal itself makes no sense in the context of the world they are in. Jamie then takes Brienne's virginity, and it seems as though Jamie might be the one character spared the writer's butchery. He seems to have moved on from Cersei and fully redeemed himself for his past misdeeds. He now has a new life as an honourable man, and will likely marry Brienne and have many tall children. I sure hope the writers don't throw all this character development away needlessly. Just wait till you see what I'm about to do. Danny and Jon share a private moment, and she tells him that Jorah loved her, but she didn't love him the way she loves Jon. Even in death, Jorah is getting cucked. Jon and Danny passionately kiss, but Jon stops. Danny says she wishes Jon never told her about his parents, and who he really is. She says that everyone in the banquet hall looked at Jon the way others have looked at her in the past, as a king. Jon says that he doesn't want it, but she says it won't matter when others find out. She says he must keep it a secret and swear Bran and Sam to secrecy. 
John protests that he must tell his sisters, but Danny says that Sansa will want her gone and John on the Iron Throne if she finds out. This makes little sense, as what Sansa wants is irrelevant as Daenerys is the one with the powerful army. Danny claims Sansa is not the little girl John grew up with. This is more of the writers simply telling us that Sansa has changed and become a formidable player of the Game of Thrones, rather than actually bothering to develop her character. Danny begs John not to tell them, as it will destroy them. John responds with one of the five sentences he gets to recite this season. You're my queen! John says they can all live together, and Danny agrees, saying she has just told him how. This is the writer's rather desperate attempt to lay the groundwork for Danny's turn in episode 5. I'll cover this in more detail when we get to that moment, but it should go without saying that you need to lay the groundwork for a fundamental change in a character much sooner than the episode before it happens. Some might argue that Danny has always been something of a psychopath, and has killed multiple people throughout the series. However, there is a rather stark difference between killing your enemies, and even killing formerly enemy soldiers that simply refuse to bend the knee to you, and systematically and intentionally slaughtering hundreds of thousands of innocents by burning them to death, and destroying their homes. Danny's sudden shift in episode 5 is just that, a sudden shift. No amount of arguing about killing slavers that have murdered innocent children is going to make Danny's actions make sense. But like I said, we'll get to that in good time. The following day, we see a meeting of Danny's makeshift council. Yon Royce claims that half the Vale army have been killed, and the random Dothraki guy says the same is true of the Dothraki forces. This is in stark contrast to the visual we saw in the previous episode of the Dothraki charge and seeming extermination of the army. It seems as though this was either an awkward retcon as the writers realised Danny would still need a large army going forward for their story to work, or simply a case of having their cake and eating it too, with the writers wanting this rather impressive visual without committing to its implications. Varys says that the Golden Company has arrived in King's Landing, and that Yara Greyjoy has retaken the Iron Islands. Oh, well, that was easy, I guess. It's not like that might have been something anybody would have liked to have seen. How do you think that happened, then? It's not like the Ironborn Lords have a system that's existed for god knows how many centuries to determine who will run the Iron Islands or anything. No, that doesn't matter anymore because Yara has just taken them back off-screen. This show fucking sucks. And yeah, I'm sure Euron wouldn't have bothered to protect his own seat of power or anything. Absolutely garbage writing. Varys also claims that the new Prince of Dawn has pledged his support. I'm sorry? The new Prince of Dawn? Who the fuck is the new Prince of Dawn? Does this motherfucker have a name? Particularly a last name? Last we saw of Dawn, it was taken over by the Sand Snakes and Ilaria Sand. And now they're all dead. So what happened there exactly? Ah, who cares, right? Let's just get this shit over with. We have other franchises to ruin. I mean, further ruin. But this does pose a question. Why would the Prince of Dawn pledge allegiance to Daenerys? Maybe he just thinks she's winning the war and wants to align with the winning side? Dawn is famously an ostensibly independent providence. They were never outright defeated by the original Targaryen invaders, hence why they still have a form of royalty. Varys said it himself, the Prince of Dawn has pledged his allegiance. So he's unlikely to have pledged allegiance because he fears the repercussions of not siding with Daenerys. So the implication is that he agrees with her cause. But why would he? At the beginning of Season 6, the Sand Snakes and Alaria betrayed the Martells, in another colossally stupid piece of wrap-this-shit-up storytelling, and essentially took Dawn for themselves. They straight up murdered Duran Martell and his children. And then at the end of the season, Daenerys made an alliance with them. Instead of killing the traitors, taking their heads back to Dawn, and making an allegiance with the new Prince of Dawn, Daenerys simply chose to side with the treacherous and murderous usurpers. And I'm supposed to believe that now the Dornish people have presumably sorted out their inner turmoil, and reinstated a monarch in the new Prince of Dawn, that they are immediately happy to side with Daenerys again? I hate this. Remember when the internal politics and machinations of the characters on the board was the highlight of the show? And now it's ignored shoved to the back of the mind to make way for more nonsensical garbage. The group begins to form plans for the invasion of King's Landing to take the Iron Throne for Daenerys. Tyrion says they should starve them out, that if the people are hungry, they will denounce the Queen. Jon says to surround the city. If the Iron Fleet try to bring food, the dragons can destroy the fleet. And if they engage, they can destroy them in the field. This sounds reasonable. Although, of course, it begs the question, if you are capable of doing that, why don't you? If the dragons are able to destroy the Iron Fleet, then why not just go do that? The point is to weaken Cersei's position and standing with the people so they abandon her, right? So wouldn't destroying the Iron Fleet substantially weaken her position? We saw at the beginning of the season that the fleet is docked in the harbour at night, 
and seemingly left alone as Theon was able to get in, free Yara, and get out without either of them being seen, so you could wait until night and fly the dragons in and roast the entire fleet. Sansa says the men are tired and wounded and need to rest before they can march south and potentially engage in another big battle. Danny says she fought for the North at great expense, and now when it's her turn, the North wants to postpone? Yes, you moron. They want to actually win the battle, and to do that, they need to rest and heal their wounds? Immediately marching ahead, a day after their last battle, which pushed them to the brink, is spectacularly stupid. And let's be clear here, Daenerys would know this. She'd know this because it's logical. Anyone with half a mind could figure out the soldiers need a rest between wars. The only reason Daenerys acts indignantly here is because it's more lazily forced writing to make her seem unreasonable and unstable, to justify her turn in episode 5. It's actually rather comical when you really stop and break down the pacing of this season. The writers clearly realised they couldn't turn Danny into the Mad Queen until after the battle with the Night King, because if she was a psycho that wanted to massacre innocents, why would she even bother helping them in the first place? But they also didn't want to blow their load at the beginning of the season, so they decided to have the long night battle in the middle of the season at episode 3, and they wanted the finale to be the aftermath of Danny's turn to the dark side, and then the resolution to the stories of all the characters we've been following. So Danny's turn had to come in either episode 4 or 5. They also must have figured they needed to lay some groundwork for her turn. Some will argue that they did that in previous seasons, but if they had laid sufficient groundwork in previous seasons, to justify massacring the population of King's Landing, then why is she so willing to help save the Northerners? Do you see how that's one big contradiction? If she's already mental, then why is she acting against her own self-interests in order to save innocent lives? You can say it's because she loves Jon, I guess, but that gets in the way of the idea that she has already been established as capable of genocide, doesn't it? Whichever way you slice it, it's clear this type of hackneyed writing is a rushed attempt at laying the groundwork for her turn in episode 5. You'd think even if they didn't want to take a couple more seasons to flesh out Danny's turn, they'd have at least taken a few more episodes to do so. John steps in and agrees with Danny, saying they will honour the agreement. What he should have said is, We will honour the agreement, but Sansa is also right, and the men do need to rest and recover. Marching them into another battle straight away is simply marching them to their deaths. We can run the risk of revolt. We let them rest for a week. In the meantime, we send scouts south to report on Cersei's defences at King's Landing, and we send others to infiltrate the Iron Fleet and figure out where they dock and what time is best to attack. If we can take them unawares, we can destroy the fleet from the sky with dragons and we'll leave Cersei all but defenceless. McQueen. Tyrion says Jon will take the King's Road with most of the troops, while Danny's advisors will sail to Dragonstone with Danny flying the dragons above, which implies that Danny will arrive before anyone else, which seems risky. It also means the bulk of the enemy will be far behind the ship of advisors too, leaving them largely unguarded. This sounds like a rather stupid decision, and one likely written to further weaken Danny's position and build towards her turn in episode 5. Jon, Arya, and Sansa then argue over Jon's decision. Sansa flippantly acknowledges the sacrifice of Danny's men in fighting for the North, but then she and Arya claim they don't trust her. And while I can understand their reluctance to a certain degree, given she is someone they only just met and seems rather bloodthirsty, this still rings rather hollow. Danny marched her entire army north to fight for them just days ago, and if she hadn't, the entire North would have been slaughtered by the Night King and his army. You'd think she'd have earned a modicum of trust. John says not trusting other people won't get them many allies, to which Arya responds that she doesn't need many. This is another dumb line. You are now heading off to battle. Of course you need allies. And without the many allies that just fought with you in the Long Night, just a day ago, you'd likely all be dead. Arya says they are a family, the last of the Starks. John says he's never been a Stark, and they insist he is their brother and just as much Ned Stark's child as any of them because just when you thought the writing couldn't get more on the nose, the characters look straight in the camera and fucking wink at you. John then looks at Bran, who says it's John's choice, which essentially takes the choice away from John, because there's no way Arya and Sansa are going to let things be after that cryptic line. John makes them both swear not to tell anyone else, and then tells Bran to tell them, and... we cut away. What? What do you mean we cut away? Why? Why would you do that? This show has spent the better part of a decade toying with the reveal about John's parents. And now, just as we're about to see his sisters find out he isn't actually their brother, the episode just cuts away. Yeah, I'm sure no one wanted to see Arya and Sansa's reactions to such a life-altering revelation. It's not just a revelation that he is a Targaryen, not a Stark. 
nor that he is their cousin, not brother, but it's also the revelation that their honour-bound father had lied to them their entire lives. It's an understandable lie, to be sure, but it would still come as a shock to them, no doubt. But who needs to see that, right? We then see Tyrion and Jaime discussing relationships, and after making a few tall jokes, Tyrion says he's happy for Jaime, who seems content and happy with Brienne. Suddenly Bronn walks in with a crossbow, wearing a fucking cape. Bronn punches Tyrion for mouthing off, and tells them about Cersei's offer. However, he says he knew Cersei was dead the moment he saw the dragons. We see Jaime react with slight trepidation here, foreshadowing the imminent destruction of his character. Tyrion mentions the deal they struck back in Season 1, and offers Bronn Highgarden in exchange for letting them live, which Bronn accepts. This makes little sense, as there's seemingly no way that Tyrion could have the power to make that happen. What's more, there would likely already be a new Lord of Highgarden. There are no doubt successes lined up, and if not, it's likely that a lord of the region that served as a bannerman for the Tyrells has claimed Highgarden for himself. I suppose it's possible that Tyrion could ask Daenerys to take Highgarden and install Bronn as lord, but it's doubtful if she would acquiesce to such a demand. Bronn then leaves, declining to fight in the war to come, as if Bronn wasn't already unreliable and untrustworthy enough. Oh well, it's not like he'll be gifted a highly important and powerful position under the new king when all is said and done or anything. We then see the Hound leaving Winterfell, and he is joined by Arya. The Hound says he has unfinished business in King's Landing. Arya agrees, and says she doesn't plan on returning. What the hell is this crap? So Arya, who has been away from her family and home for years, and just recently returned and reunited with her family. Then, just moments ago, she is saddled with the revelation that her brother is not actually her brother, but her cousin. He is the heir to the Iron Throne, Fucking clean. And her father had kept this a secret from their entire family. And her immediate response is not to try and comfort John or take any time to deal with the revelation and try and keep her family together, nor is it to help John take his rightful place on the Iron Throne. No, it's to hightail it out of there. What the fuck? Sansa and Tyrion have a conversation about Daenerys. Tyrion tells Sansa not to provoke her, and Sansa says Tyrion is afraid of her. Sansa says the men in her family don't do well in the capital, and Tyrion responds that Jon is not technically a Stark. It's implied that Sansa then tells Tyrion the truth about Jon's parents. This is all set up for Denny's eventual turn, but in doing so it directly damages the characters involved. Here Sansa is about to go back on her word to Jon to keep his parentage a secret, and she does this almost immediately after swearing that she won't. It's possibly the closest she comes to actually playing the game, because she is counting on Tyrion spreading the information around, which says a lot about how far Tyrion has fallen as a character, given it was he that used to do the same thing, but it essentially cheapens her relationship with Jon. If this was a decision she came to after much deliberation over the space of a few episodes, or even a season, then it might have worked, but instead she did it almost immediately. This is likely a consequence of the truncated length of the season and the rushed nature of the series' conclusion. Tommen tells Jon he's taking the Free Folk north once the winter snows pass. Which could be years, if the lore surrounding winters in the series is anything to go on. But it doesn't matter, because at the end of the series, everything still resembles a giant block of ice up north. And the free folk go back further north anyway. I also have to wonder what the point of going further north even is. There are available lands right there in the north. And there aren't that many free folk left after the battle. It seems like a contrivance in order to set up the final shot of the series. Jon asks Tormund to take Ghost with him because abandoning him with strangers after you've raised him from a pup is better for him than taking him south. Or just having someone who's staying at Winterfell look after him until you return? Jon then says goodbye to Sam and Gilly and finally realises Gilly is pregnant, because he'd been blind before. If this baby is anything like the last one, Jon will likely be dead of old age before it's even born. Jon then gives a weak nod to Ghost as a goodbye before leaving. This seemed a rather lacklustre goodbye, given Jon found Ghost in the very first episode of the show, and has been with him ever since. When fans question the showrunners on this, they claim there wasn't enough budget to have a proper goodbye scene between the two. However, in the finale, likely as a direct response to this criticism, we see a proper scene between Jon and Ghost. Given that we get this scene, and the fact that HBO claimed they were willing to write the production a blank check to keep the series going, I'd say the initial scene where Jon simply nods to Ghost was all we were going to get until the fan backlash. The writers clearly didn't give it much thought, or if they did, they either thought this was a suitable enough send-off, which is somewhat damning in its own right, or they just couldn't be bothered to write a better scene. 
Regardless, this way of thinking really explains the conclusion of the series as a whole. Tyrion then spills the beans to Varys about Jon's lineage, just as Sansa had hoped he would. This one move is basically Sansa's time playing the Game of Thrones in its totality. That sure makes up for four seasons of doing fucking nothing, huh? Tyrion proposes a marriage pact between Jon and Danny, which I suppose is better than Gendry straight up proposing to Arya earlier in the episode. Varys claims that marrying your cousin isn't common in the North. I think with everything the North has gone through over the past decade, they'd settle for anything that doesn't involve more of them being horrifically killed. He also says that Danny doesn't want to share the throne. This might be true in the sense that the writers have suddenly started portraying her as a mental case, hell-bent on claiming total power above all else, but that doesn't really work with the way she's been portrayed up to this point. I mean, Danny has risked her life, and the lives of those she loves, including her dragons, in order to save the North. And she largely agreed to that because she had fallen in love with Jon Snow. That was the rationale in Season 7 in order to get her into the North for the Battle with the Dead, but now she wouldn't be willing to share the throne with the man she loves and knows is the rightful heir? Have you bothered to even ask her? Or tell Jon to ask her? Nah, Varys didn't do that because that's not what the writers want. They want the Mad Queen. And they want it now. Logic be damned. The rush to turn her necessitates the rush to have Varys lose faith in her. And the sad thing is, the actor who plays Varys, Conleth Hill, is so good he almost makes it believable. But no thespian, regardless of ability, can turn shit into Shakespeare. We then see Danny flying high above Dragonstone, when Rhaegal is suddenly hit with a scorpion arrow. Danny just forgot about the Iron Fleet, despite the fact she mentioned it earlier in the episode, and she is flying high above all landmasses over the ocean, and can clearly see for miles in every direction. It's not even at night, or on a cloudy day, or raining or anything. There is literally no reason for her to not be able to see the fucking Iron Fleet off to her left. This is absolutely ridiculously contrived garbage. And the flat manner in which Benioff defends the decision, which was a rather popular meme a year ago. While Danny kind of forgot about the Iron Fleet and Euron's forces, they certainly haven't forgotten about her. Highlights the utter lack of care for the product being created. And make no mistake, that's what it is at this point. A product. So Rhaegal is struck in the chest with the arrow, and despite this, he keeps flying in the exact same spot so that he can get hit with two more arrows and die. He doesn't even make an attempt to move out of the path of the arrows. Think about how dumb that is. If you have ever interacted with an animal, you know they can jump at the slightest of things. I'm no hunter, but I think if you shot a deer and it didn't immediately die, it would probably run off. I doubt it would fucking stand there and wait to get shot again. The bolt didn't hit his wings or anything, and it's not like he was still chained up in a holding cell and unable to get away. He's a dragon flying in the sky. The stupid thing is, the riders could have easily fixed this. Just have multiple scorpion arrows hit him at the same time. I assume they wanted the shock of the initial hit, then Danny's reaction, and then the next two hits followed by Rhaegal's death. But in doing that, they sacrificed the logic of the scene, such as it was. And for what? What was accomplished here that shooting Rhaegal with three arrows at once wouldn't have accomplished? Other than destroying the little logic that remained in the scene, that is. So Rhaegal dies. And for some reason, Daenerys keeps flying in the same spot too, despite having just watched her dragon get shot and killed. More arrows are fired, but luckily for her, Euron suddenly can't shoot for shit and misses her. I guess he just forgot how to aim. This shit reminds me of The Dark Knight Rises, when Bane is hanging in the broken plane that's attached to another plane, and yet the ground below him isn't moving at all? Since Amelia Clark isn't actually riding a dragon, they could have easily fixed this in post and had her fly out of the way before Euron started shooting at her. Instead, he suddenly sucks at shooting because she's a name above the title talent. The Iron Fleet then comes out from hiding behind nothing. Seriously, am I meant to believe the entire fleet was hiding behind these little rocks and Danny wasn't able to see them? Danny flies straight at Euron in a fit of rage and Euron doesn't try and shoot her. Then as soon as he does try and shoot her, she is able to move out of the way. Oh, so you do know how to do that. This is despite the fact that dozens of arrows are being shot at her now. Oh, so you were able to do that too. I give up. This isn't even a question of being annoyed at where the story is going, although I certainly am. They can't even get basic logic right. Even their own logic is thrown out from one shot to the next. Not even one scene to the next. This is logic being established and then abandoned from shot to shot. Instead of circling around behind the Iron Fleet and destroying it, she just flies away, abandoning her fleet in the process. By the way, she still wins. Even after losing two dragons and having her fleet destroyed, she is still able to take King's Landing with a withered army and one dragon. So all of that build-up for multiple seasons, where she gathered several armies and acquired her fleet 
was essentially all for nothing, because she mostly takes the Red Keep with one dragon. Euron then focuses his attention to Danny's fleet, destroying it with scorpion arrows. If he'd have fired as many arrows at Danny, Drogon, and Rhaegal as he does to her ships, he would have likely killed her, both dragons, and won the war right there. Also, I guess, even after coming in direct contact with scorpion arrows in Season 7 when Bronn shot Drogon with one, Danny still didn't bother to have her men create some of their own to defend the fleet should they come under attack. With no way to defend themselves, the fleet is destroyed. Tyrion jumps off a ship and into the water, narrowly avoiding death by the arrows, only to seemingly be knocked out by a falling mast. The show pulls the old cut away trick so we don't actually see him die, which means he almost certainly inexplicably survived. Yep, there he is. He washes up on shore seemingly without harm. I don't understand why they pull cheap tricks like that. Like, what's the point? No one thinks Tyrion is dying thanks to a falling mast in the third to last episode of the show. It's just pointless baiting. Grey Worm, Tyrion, Davos, and all the characters that matter easily survive the ordeal. Because of course they do. A mountain could fall on them, and they'd all survive at this point. The group quickly realises that Masande is missing. They seem to act as though Masande is missing rather than killed during the destruction of the fleet. They are all on shore, mere metres from the destroyed fleet that Masande was just on with them, and their instinct is to say that she has been captured by Euron's forces, rather than killed by arrows or falling debris or drowned in the attack. And why do they think in this illogical way? Why does no one even consider she might have been killed in the attack? Because the writers know that she's been captured, and thus they instantly impart that knowledge onto their characters. They took Masande. Rather than have them search the wreckage or show Grey Worm devastated assuming she's been killed, only to have Tyrion claim that she might have been captured instead in an attempt to comfort him, the writers just fast forward past that stuff and have the characters instantly know she's been captured. It's so dumb, that's all you can really say about it. Cersei and Kyburn talk about their propaganda working on the people as they watch the citizens of King's Landing enter the gates of the Red Keep. Cersei says if Danny wants to take the castle, she'll need to kill thousands of innocents to do it. Why? Are the people going to fight her men? Of course not. They'll surrender immediately. And they sure as shit aren't going to mess with a dragon. Unless Cersei fills her own castle with innocents to protect her from Danny just roasting her with dragon fire. Danny could just fly over the people and head straight for the castle. Then she could roast Cersei and take the Iron Throne. Sure, her men would need to come in and clear out the Lannister soldiers, but they still aren't going to need to slaughter innocents to win the battle. In fact, in episode 5, the innocents are nowhere to be seen during the battle between Cersei's army and Danny's army. They only show up just so Danny can hunt them down and kill them unnecessarily. This line of thinking is more nonsensical bullshit designed to try and convince you that Danny's turn next episode makes sense. But it even fails in that, if you really think about it. Because if it's true that Danny will have no choice than to kill innocents in order to take the Iron Throne, then aren't you preemptively walking back her turn? If she has no choice, doesn't that somewhat take away from her becoming the Mad Queen? Is she really a total psychopath if she has been given no choice? Let me make another quick comparison to Breaking Bad. In the fifth episode of the first season, Walt gets an offer from a previous business associate to pay for his cancer treatment, effectively giving him an out from the meth business. Walt turns it down flat, and by the end of the episode is back cooking crystal meth with his partner Jesse. And that was the point. The writers deliberately wanted to give Walt an out early on in the series, so his continuing to cook crystal meth and eventually becoming the drug kingpin Heisenberg was a deliberate and conscious choice. You're goddamn right. In Game of Thrones, however, the writers want to have their cake and eat it too. They make it appear as though Daenerys makes a clear choice to murder innocents in episode 5, while simultaneously giving her something of an out in episode 4. What's worse is I don't even think that was the intention. I think the writers were simply trying to bolster her turn. It's almost like they were trying to preemptively counter anyone that might claim her turn doesn't make sense. Yes it does. See, she had to do it because Cersei forced her hand. However, that takes away from her choice. All they had to do was cut that line. Sure, if she had to kill innocents to take the Iron Throne, it's still wrong, but in this type of feudal era, that certainly wouldn't be enough to consider her mad. The Mad King didn't order the deaths of the population of King's Landing because he had to in order to defeat Tywin's invading forces. He did it because he was a psychopathic murderer. Giving Danny an out walks back, at least to some degree, her choice to murder the innocent people. It takes away from her out, too. The bells ringing, signifying the surrender of the city, was her out. From that point, she didn't need to kill anyone else, except perhaps Cersei. But implying that Danny has no choice but to kill innocents in order to kill Cersei, not only is dumb and not true, 
but it gets in the way of her turn. What's worse is that's not how that scene is even portrayed. Just one episode later, this line of thinking is completely abandoned. In the episode, Danny is portrayed as having a very clear choice. She could just fly straight to Cersei and kill her, but chooses to hunt down and murder the innocent people instead. So not only does this line not make sense in the context of this scene, it doesn't make sense in the context of the scene it is attempting to set up. What a colossal mess this season was. Now is the time for the final award of the evening, Outstanding Drama Series. And the Emmy goes to Game of Thrones. The fuck are you talking about? That shit stinks. Cersei tells Euron her baby is his, and the idiot actually believes it. I swear this bitch has been pregnant for a year or two at this point. It's also revealed that Masande has indeed been captured by Euron and taken to Cersei. The first question I have is, why? Why would they think she holds any significance to Daenerys? Even if they have managed to have spies relay who she is, surely they couldn't tell Cersei and Euron much more than she's Daenerys' translator and advisor. And even if they were aware of the close relationship she has with Daenerys, how the hell did they even capture her? Are you telling me that in all the chaos of the destruction of Danny's fleet, they somehow managed to find Missandei and capture her? What is this nonsense? Varys tells Danny that attacking is a mistake, as thousands of innocents will die. Why? Why will they die? Why can't she go straight for Cersei? Even if they have more scorpions, she can, and does, destroy them. And she can avoid the Iron Fleet by simply attacking the Red Keep from the opposite side. Even if the fleet is surrounding the Red Keep, she can attack from the north and avoid flying over the ocean altogether. This is just more bullshit to make her seem like a psycho next episode. Danny says she is here to free the world from tyrants, no matter the cost. Tyrion says she should offer Cersei her life in exchange for the Iron Throne. Danny says it won't work, but the people must see she made every effort to avoid bloodshed. And they will know who to blame when the sky falls. What people? The meeting you end up having with Cersei is private, with no people there to witness it. If you expect them to blame Cersei for you destroying the Red Keep, then why even bother with the meeting in the first place? But whatever. Let's cover this dumb as fuck meeting. And seriously, this meeting is probably the most underrated scene in the season when it comes to colossally dumb scenes. Shit like the Night King's death and Danny's turn gets most of the attention, but for pure stupidity, this scene is hard to top. Varys tells Tyrion that Danny has become a tyrant. Varys then proposes Jon as king and lists his qualities, including being a man, which he claims will make him an easier sell to the Northern Lords. Given that the Northern Lords are following Lady Mormont, or were, and have been following Sansa as the Lady of Winterfell for over a season at this point, I don't know that they're too bothered about the gender of their ruler. I think at this point they'd settle for the first person that can give them a moment's peace. Also, I think what would sell Jon to the Northern Lords above all else is that Jon is a Northerner and Danny is not. Plus, he was raised as the son of Ned Stark and that would certainly hold some sway with them. Not to mention, but Jon is a former Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, has freed them from the tyranny of the Boltons and is the rightful heir. But instead, Varys focuses on Jon's gender so that Tyrion can retort that a cock is not a qualification as Joffrey was a man. Vera says he's the heir because he's a man. The show has never been all that subtle with its feminist, or perhaps third wave feminist undertones, but at this point the writers aren't even really trying. Actually, Varys, John is not the heir because he's a man. John is the heir because he is Rhaegar's natural born son. Rhaegar was the rightful heir, and when he died, John became the rightful heir. If John and Danny were siblings, and Danny was older, but John was still the heir, then that would be because he is a man, yes. But given that Danny has the Dornish on her side, she could likely invoke Dornish law and take the throne anyway. Plus, Cersei is the queen right now. No one really cares about gender at this point. We are in a purely might makes right scenario. For those that might be confused as to what I'm saying, there's actually a real world example of this that works as something of a parable. For those of you that have seen the film The King's Speech, you may recall that the current queen, Queen Elizabeth's father, became the king because his brother abdicated the throne in order to marry a divorcee. Suddenly, Britain had a new king in King George V, and when he died, his eldest daughter, Queen Elizabeth II, took the crown. If King George's brother had a child when he abdicated, then the role of king or queen would have gone to them. But he had no children, so it went to his brother. In Game of Thrones, when the Mad King died, the throne went to Rhaegar, and when he died, it would have gone to his eldest children. However, they had both been murdered by the mountain, leaving his youngest child, John, to take the throne. If John were not born, then it would have gone to Rhaegar's elder sibling, Viserys, and when he died, to his sister Daenerys. But John was born, and did survive, and thus he is the eldest child of Rhaegar, and the rightful heir. In this instance, gender had nothing to do with it. Royal lineage did. 
Varys tells Tyrion he will act in the interest of the realm no matter the personal cost, but the personal cost is crucial to being able to act in the interest of the realm. You can't serve the realm if you're taking a dirt nap. Varys said as much to Ned in season 1. Cersei's no fool. She knows a tame wolf is more used to her than a dead one. You want me to serve the woman who murdered my king, who butchered my men, who crippled my son? I want you to serve the realm! Tyrion asks what must happen, and Varys implies she must die. Why the sudden turn from Varys? This is all so rushed. What has she done at this point to suddenly change his mind? If he was going to have this change of heart, he should have done it either last season when she killed the Tarleys, or in episode 6 after she had destroyed King's Landing. Doing it now is utterly nonsensical. I just don't believe Varys would have this change of heart at this point. It's either too early or too late. This is only happening so that Danny can kill him at the start of the next episode. I, Daenerys of House Targaryen, first of my name, breaker of chains and mother of dragons, sentence you to die. And that only happens to once again try and sell Danny's turn to the dark side. If Varys actually thinks this is necessary, why would he tell Tyrion of all people? He knows Tyrion can't be trusted to keep a secret. Tyrion just told him about Jon's parentage. Back at Winterfell, Jaime sees Sansa and Brienne talking. They tell him Euron ambushed Danny's fleet, destroyed their ships, killed Rhaegal, and captured Missandei. How can they possibly know that she was captured rather than being killed? Actually, it would make more sense, and make the negotiation scene at the end of the episode make more sense, if Masande being captured was kept as a surprise until that point. Grey Worm and Daenerys could assume she had been killed, only for it to be revealed during the discussion that she was captured instead. Regardless, it makes no sense they'd know she was captured. Plus, how did this message even get to Winterfell? Did someone on the ships prioritise saving the Ravens over saving Masande? And how long did it take the raven to get to Winterfell? I'm guessing at least a day. They should have sent one of those jet speed ravens from season 7. Sansa spitefully says she wanted to be there when Cersei was executed, but now she won't get a chance. If you wanted to be there, why didn't you go with them? What did you think they were going to do when they got there? Danny is going to take the Iron Throne, and that most likely means killing Cersei. Did you think they'd just hold her captive until you decided to head down there? Even single lines of dialogue can't be trusted to not be stupid. Later that night, Jamie leaves Brienne to go back to Cersei. This is it. Eight seasons of character development pissed away. The writers had taken the odd misstep with Jamie over the course of the show, for sure. Most notably in season four, where they seemingly had him rape Cersei, or at least attempt to. It was a jarring blow to his character, but they attempted to pave over that pothole, and despite some shoddy writing, his character had managed to be one of the few to remain intact throughout the majority of the show's run. But season eight would not just destroy the remaining plot threads the audience cared about, but the remaining characters as well. In this moment, and another in the following episode, Jamie's character would be utterly destroyed. Brienne begs him to stay. She says he's a good man and doesn't need to die with Cersei. Jamie confesses that he pushed Bran out the window, killed his cousin, and would have killed everyone in River Run for Cersei. He says she is hateful, and so is he. The confession itself is not a bad moment, and the acting is still top notch. But his decision to leave Brienne and go running back to Cersei is a fundamental betrayal of the character he has become. The entire series has shown the slow and steady transformation of Jaime from arrogant oathbreaker and incestuous murderer to brave and honourable soldier. From a relationship standpoint, he has changed from a man in a toxic, dependent relationship with his own sister to a loving and natural relationship with Brienne. And this scene pisses all over that development and throws it in the trash. Some might think this is a tragedy, but it's not. It's incompetence. Danny, Tyrion, and a group of Unsullied wait outside the gates of King's Landing, with Drogon waiting behind them. This is a barren piece of land unlike any we have seen before. Not to mention, there appears to be no snow whatsoever. Do you remember the end of last season, when Jaime finally moved on from Cersei, giving his character arc a massive boost, only for it to be walked back this episode? Well, if you recall, when he left King's Landing, it was starting to snow, thus signifying the official beginning of winter. And yet, here we are, just a couple weeks later, and there's no snow at all. I guess the writers just forgot. Cersei, Euron, and the Mountain are standing on the wall of King's Landing. They have dozens of armed scorpions on the walls, pointing directly at Danny and her small party. And Drogon is far enough away that Danny could be easily killed before he could help her. They could even kill Drogon too. Cersei could win the war right here with just one wave of her hand. Does she do it? Of course not. This writing is so awful, and there is no excuse for it. It was bad enough last season when Tyrion spoke with Cersei alone, when he knows she wants him dead. But this takes that to a whole new level. It's more than just incompetence at this point. You have to be stupid to write this and not notice the glaring plot holes. Kyburn talks with Tyrion in No Man's Land. 
Tyrion claims Danny wants Cersei to surrender and release Masande. Kyburn says Cersei wants Danny's surrender or Masande will die. If that's what Cersei wants, then why doesn't she just kill Danny right now? If she isn't prepared to surrender or negotiate for her life, then just open fire. Tyrion claims Cersei's reign is over, but Kyburn disagrees, stating their rather strong position. Kill her. She's right there and so is her best weapon, her dragon. Kill them both and win the war right now. Tyrion walks past Kyburn and tries to talk to Cersei. As he approaches the wall, archers ready to fire. They could easily kill everyone right now. This is so dumb. Cersei motions them to hold off, which implies that she could motion them to fire if she wanted. Tyrion is then able to calmly talk to Cersei, who is approximately three stories high. Whatever. Tyrion tries to appeal to Cersei, saying she's not a monster and loves her children. Tyrion begs her to surrender for the sake of the child inside of her. This bitch has been pregnant for two seasons and isn't even showing. Cersei contemplates this before telling Missande to say her last words. Missande is on the wall with Cersei, and given how close Cersei is to her, she could have grabbed her and thrown herself off the wall, killing herself, but also killing Cersei, and effectively ending the war. I could understand her not doing that if she thought she had a chance to live, but Cersei has just told her she's going to die. She has nothing to lose, so why not try it at least? Oh, because Cersei is supposed to live for another episode, and then die in a lifeless, flat, and anticlimactic scene instead. Missande whispers Dracarys in order to pop the brain dead crowds that seem to love this shit unconditionally. Dracarys. You need to shut the fuck up! Cersei then orders the mountain to kill her, and he does, cutting her head clean off. Daenerys is visibly angered by this and storms off. Cersei has essentially just declared war on Daenerys, and yet she allows her to leave. Not only that, but Danny presumably leaves on Drogon. Cersei could open fire right now while Danny has her back turned and kill her, kill Tyrion, and kill Drogon at the same time. The war would effectively be over. With the 20,000 men from the Golden Army there to protect the city, the Iron Fleet to protect the sea, and Danny and her dragons dead, even if Jon wanted to besiege the city, he would be unlikely to be able to take it, and his tired and depleted forces would likely be killed in open battle. Of course, he could simply starve them out, as food would be unable to reach the city during the siege, but simple things like that haven't mattered for a very long time. Honestly, as bad as episode 3 was in destroying the White Walker storyline, this episode is on par in terms of terrible writing. What an absolute disaster. It's terrifying down there. We're in a crypt. Nobody thought of that. He's bringing all the dead people back to life, and they put the women and children in a crypt with all the dead people. So, rah. Tyrion is smart, but I guess not that smart. Episode 5 opens with a previously on that is rather desperate to sell Daenerys as mad. We then see Varys writing a letter that names Jon as the true heir to the Iron Throne. There is a sudden knock at the door and Varys brilliantly covers the evidence of his treason with some paper. Thankfully it's just one of his spies, a little girl, who says that Daenerys won't eat. Varys tells her to try again tomorrow, implying he has enlisted her to poison Danny. The girl says soldiers are watching her and Varys says of course they are. And we're jumping straight back into the nonsense, aren't we? Varys meets Jon at the shore as he arrives. He tells him every time a Targaryen is born, the gods flip a coin, implying there is a 50-50 shot as to whether that Targaryen will be normal or mad. Jon says he's not one for riddles. Jon, this isn't a riddle. He's straight up telling you that the bitch is mental. Fucking birds now. Varys says he is the rightful heir to the Iron Throne and will be a good king. Jon repeats two of his three lines of the season. I don't, I don't want, want it. it. She's my queen. Tyrion watches this and then goes to see a rather withered and emaciated looking Daenerys. I imagine this new look for Danny is done to sell her rapid descent into madness. Funny though, not only do the writers claim that she only goes mad when she hears the bells ring later in the episode, as she stares at the Red Keep, but when she goes mental, she appears to be fine and looks nothing like she appears now in this scene. Tyrion does then speak in riddles as he claims she has been betrayed. She assumes it is Jon, and Tyrion corrects her that it is Varys. Jesus, just when you think the desecration of Tyrion's character couldn't get worse, he pulls this shit. Firstly, he has no actual knowledge of Varys' betrayal. He cleverly covered it up with paper, you may recall. But seriously, all Tyrion has is a conversation he held with Varys, where he insinuated that Daenerys had become a tyrant. He doesn't actually have any evidence that he has betrayed her directly. After all, Varys of all people wouldn't be stupid enough to betray her and stick around in order to be captured and killed, right? And why didn't Tyrion go to Varys first and give him the chance to leave Dragonstone before telling Danny of his betrayal? 
Didn't he owe him that much at least? Varys risked his own neck to rescue Tyrion from certain death, only for Tyrion to sell him out with little provocation. What a bitch Tyrion is. Tyrion admits to telling Varys about Jon, essentially putting the thought of betraying Danny in favour of Jon in his head. Varys goes right back to writing notes, seemingly to no one as we never see him send these notes to anyone, and it's never brought up by anyone after his death. He hears soldiers coming and sets fire to the note and then puts it in a pot. Putting aside the fact that fire requires oxygen and therefore putting the lit note in the pot likely put the fire out, the fact that he burns the note here begs the question, why didn't he do that before? Grey Worm then arrests Varus and brings him to a cave on the beach. Denny sentences him to death. Tyrion tells Varus it was he that told Daenerys about his treachery. Honestly, at this point, Tyrion is nothing like the actual character Tyrion. It's one thing to simply run out of ideas for a character, it's another thing entirely to bastardise one so badly they don't even remotely resemble their original form. This isn't even a case of character development. Around season 6, Tyrion just became a useless idiot and never evolved from that point. Outside of the fact he is still played by Peter Dinklage, in what way does Tyrion resemble the person he was in seasons 1-4? to four? Tyrion and Danny then watch as Drogon roasts Varys alive. Looking back at this rather iconic scene between Littlefinger and Varys in season 3, could anyone have imagined such undignified and unworthy ends for these two characters as that which they received? What absolute garbage writing. How is this in any way a satisfying conclusion to Varys' part in the story? What was his point ultimately? He schemed for years to put Daenerys Targaryen on the Iron Throne, then changed his mind and in a matter of days was executed. Fascinating stuff. Best of my name. This is to say nothing of the fact that Varys wouldn't act in this way. Varys may want to serve the realm and do what's best for it, but certainly not at the expense of his own life. He can't very well serve if he's roasted to ash. The moment he sensed that Tyrion wasn't on board with his plan, he would have snuck away in the dead of night never to be seen again. At the very least, he would have made a break for it when he was suspicious enough of a knock at the door that he felt he needed to hide the note he was writing. If you are going to write Varys to betray Danny and be self-conscious of it enough that he hides it from a simple knock at the door, then surely you would know your character well enough to know that he would have run by now, right? The sad thing is, it doesn't matter. Even if the writers were aware of that, they had no intention of changing it. Because if Varys got away, that would be another thread that would need to be tied up later. And that was the point of writing Varys to betray Danny in the first place. To have her then kill him off to tie up the loose end of his character. Sure, it meant Varys and Tyrion had to act completely out of character, but who cares, right? Let's wrap this shit up. Danny gives Grey Worm Masande's only possession, her leather collar from when she was a slave, and Grey Worm throws it into the fire. I'm pretty sure Masande owned a bunch of dresses and some jewelry. Couldn't you have given him those too? Also, leather doesn't really burn. You know what? It doesn't matter. Danny says Sansa killed Varys as much as she did, and that this is a victory for Sansa. I guess in a weird way she's kind of right? Sansa was counting on Tyrion to be the moron he's been written as for the last few seasons, and spill the beans about Jon, which she did. But could Sansa have really counted on Varys being a total idiot, and openly betraying Daenerys while still living on the same island as her? Privately, Jon and Danny talk about the Iron Throne. Jon repeats two of his assigned lines again. I don't want it. You're my queen. She tries to sleep with Jon and he rejects her. Danny says she can rule with fairness or fear, and after Jon rejects her, she says let it be fear. At a planning meeting, Tyrion tells Danny that thousands of children will die if Danny burns the city. That alone should have been enough to stop Danny from doing what she does. She has always wanted to avoid killing innocent people, especially children. She ended up staying in Marine and ruling it for longer than she planned in order to eradicate slavery, and she did that largely out of spite to the slave masters after they murdered hundreds of slave children as a warning to her. Regardless, this is supposed to be an advisor meeting, and yet Tyrion's attempts to advise Danny continue to be terrible. Here's an idea. Tell her not to burn the city, but just the Castle of the Red Keep specifically. Her goal is to kill Cersei and take the Iron Throne, remember? Tyrion says the city will surrender if they ring the bells, and says if she hears that, to call off the attack. It's one thing if they're going to contradict a previously established fact for something small. It would still be poor writing, but it could be forgiven. But the idea that ringing bells means surrender is not only a direct contradiction of something Davos said back in Season 2. Is that welcoming the new king? I've never known bells to mean surrender. But it's directly tied to a major plot point and character turn. 
It's such a pivotal moment for the series, it can't be ignored or overlooked. It's just so blatant, and shines a spotlight on the lazy and incompetent writing of this season. This is arguably the second biggest moment in the entire show after the failure that was the death of the Night King, and it hinges on something that contradicts a previously established rule. Denny tells Grey Worm to hold the army outside the city and wait for her, and that he will know when it's time. She tells Tyrion the next time he fails her will be the last time. And then next episode, when he publicly turns on her, she doesn't kill him. Because things don't matter from one episode to the next anymore. Despite leaving Winterfell before the army, Arya and the Hound arrive after them. Sure, why not? Who even cares about logic anymore? I'm sure it's a lot easier for an entire army to travel across the country than it is for two people. Tyrion sees Jaime has been captured and sends the Unsullied guarding him away so that he can speak with him. The fact they would just listen to Tyrion and leave their post guarding a fugitive who happens to be related to Tyrion is dumb enough. But the conversation is even worse. Jaime says he got caught because he forgot to remove his golden hand. He then says Cersei always called him the stupidest Lannister. Let's set aside the fact that I don't recall her ever calling him that on screen. That's what they came up with. That's what the writers could muster with all their brain power to explain how Jaime got caught. He forgot to remove his golden hand, so he was spotted and captured. Remember the days when it took a lot of effort to capture Jamie? Tyrion says Jamie can reason with Cersei in order to save the lives of the innocent people of King's Landing. Jamie says he never really cared about the innocents. This is not Jamie. This isn't even remotely the same character as he was even one episode ago, let alone five seasons ago. The destruction of Jamie Lannister is much worse than the damage done to Tyrion. Sure, Tyrion is nothing like his former self, but this is worse than that. With Jaime, the writers have undone eight seasons of development. Unlike Tyrion, Jaime kept growing past season four. Sure, he had some awful storylines, but he kept growing even if it was incrementally. And the moment he really turned the corner was when he left Cersei at the end of season seven. A rare bright spot in a season of shit. And now his development has been completely walked back. In fact, it's not even been walked back, it's been utterly changed. Even at the start of the show, when he was a smug, callous, and at times downright evil person, it was essentially all a mask, hiding the real person he was. And that person was someone who broke his oath to protect the Mad King in order to save the lives of half a million innocent people. Tell me if your precious Brandy commanded you to kill your own father and stand by while thousands of men, women and children burned alive, would you have done it? Would you have kept your oath then? How many lives have you saved? Half a million. The population of King's Landing. The scene in the bath where he reveals this to Brienne and the audience reshapes the way in which we have thought about Jamie previously. And yet here, the writers are essentially saying that wasn't true. But that doesn't make any sense. He did break his oath, and he did save those innocent people. And there doesn't seem to be an ulterior motive for Jamie to tell Tyrion he doesn't care about the innocent people either. If they wanted him to convey that Cersei means more to him than them, then they could have just had him say that. Suddenly acting like he doesn't care about the innocent people is just nonsense. Tyrion then tells Jaime there is a dinghy waiting for Jaime and Cersei at the beach beneath the Red Keep. He says if the winds are kind, they might sail to Essos. Firstly, there are no sails on a dinghy. It's a rowboat, so you can't sail. Secondly, to get to Essos, he'd have had to row across the narrow sea, which would surely take him years. You'd think it would be wiser to row to the Iron Fleet and get Euron to give them a ship. Also, if Davos was able to smuggle that dinghy to that beach, then couldn't they have smuggled in an assassin to go and kill Cersei? I guess Tyrion didn't want his sister to be killed even after everything she had done to him, so I guess he really is working in opposition to Daenerys' best interests. Jaime agrees to take Cersei and flee. He says Danny will kill Tyrion for releasing him, and Tyrion says he never thought he'd get to repay the favour of Jaime freeing him from back in Season 4. Tyrion says Jaime was the only one who didn't treat him like a monster. They embrace and say goodbye for the final time. The writers tease Jaime revealing the truth about Tyrion's first wife, but he never actually does. This seemed like one last fuck you from the writers. It's funny, the scene where Jaime frees Tyrion but doesn't tell him the truth about Tysha is essentially the moment the show fell apart, and here the writers had the opportunity to try and fix some of that damage before the show wraps up for good, and they once again chose not to. It's rather baffling, really. Not doing the reveal back in Season 4 took away from the scene where Tyrion kills Tywin. If they'd finally done the reveal here, it wouldn't have magically fixed that scene, but it would have given Tyrion some resolution, and would have given him motivation for the conclusion of the series. What would have been a better ending for the character of Tyrion? A retelling of a lame joke? Or seeing him swear off whoring and drinking, and leave the comforts of castles and palaces, determined to find his wife, 
and perhaps achieve a quiet life of peace and happiness. I don't, I don't really think, think I need to say. say. We see Arya the Hound and Jaime sneak into the city, and we see the army of the Golden Company lined up outside the walls, awaiting the battle with Daenerys' army, because once again, the riders don't understand siege tactics. Is it not to the Golden Company's advantage to stay within the walls of the castle, and allow Danny's army to exhaust themselves trying to get in? We see the two armies lined up opposite each other, but Danny's army doesn't attack as they have been instructed to wait for Danny's cue. But if the Golden Company are outside the walls, then I assume they expect there to be a battle. So what's to stop them attacking first? The Living lined up outside the walls of Winterfell in Episode 3, and they attacked first. So why don't the Golden Company attack? If they actually have 20,000 armed and well-rested men, as the series claims, then surely they have the advantage already. Why not attack Danny's army and slaughter them on the field, Ramsay style? Instead, they politely stand there, waiting for Daenerys to arrive to signal her army to attack. It's almost like they read the script and knew that's what they were supposed to do. Ladies and gentlemen, here are the nominees for writing for a drama series. Game of Thrones, The Iron Throne, written by David Benioff and D.B. Weiss. <laughs> are you serious? Denny then flies Drogon at the Iron Fleet, much like she did in the previous episode when Rhaegar was killed. There are hundreds of ships here, and if we are to believe the claims made in the show, there are a thousand ships in the Iron Fleet. Yet only two scorpion arrows are fired at Daenerys, both by Euron. They both miss, even though she is flying in a straight line directly at them. Danny then easily destroys the Iron Fleet with Dragonfire, which begs the question of why she didn't do this in the previous episode. It might be reasonably assumed she was worried the scorpions would kill Drogon if she did, but she attacks here and they don't even bother shooting at her. We cut back to the armies lined up outside the walls, and the supposed 20,000 man golden army appears to be about 500 men at most. You'd think the CGI budget would have allowed them to digitally create a full army. Maybe they couldn't fit them all in this location? But that begs the question, why put them in this location in the first place? Why not have the battle take place in more of an open field? Well, it's because Daenerys' signal to start the battle is her blasting through the wall behind the Golden Company with Drogon. She burns most of the men, and the Unsullied kill what's left in mere seconds. The battle is over before it even begins. There's so much about this one moment that's stupid, so let's break it down. Firstly, the 20,000 man army is shrunk down to about 500 men, so they can all be crammed into this location, so that Danny can do her surprise attack and kill them. This is another case of logic and consistency being discarded for the sake of a visual. Then the bigger issue is that the series has spent more than a season building up the Golden Company as a formidable force. Euron left to collect them last season, and there have been several scenes dedicated to explaining to the audience how much of a threat they are, and then they are just tossed away like they are nothing. Why? What was the point in even bringing them into the story if they were just going to be discarded like they were a worthless pile of trash? Seems like a bunch of wasted screen time that could have been spent doing something, anything else. Harry Strickland, the Golden Company commander, is quickly killed by Grey Worm, rendering his character utterly worthless. And the interview in which the actor, Mark Rissman, tries to imply the character has depth, utterly hilarious. At least it would be if this wasn't supposed to be the epic conclusion to eight years of investment. The Dothraki seem to have magically restocked their numbers after they were seemingly wiped out at the beginning of the battle during the Long Night, as we see them sacking the city. We see Danny destroying several of the scorpions on the walls of the city with Drogon, but she leaves several untouched and they choose not to fire at her for some reason. Tyrion then slowly walks through a flaming war zone for no reason, because other than telling cringe jokes and giving useless advice, Walking sullenly through ravaged battlegrounds is about all Tyrion does anymore. Cersei tells Kyburn that all they need is one good shot. Yeah, and you should have taken it last episode when you had the chance. In fact, this is Cersei we're talking about. She's all about fighting dirty, and she absolutely would have taken the shot when she had the chance. Regardless, Kyburn says all of the scorpions have been destroyed. How do you know that? Plus, I could see some in the previous shot that weren't destroyed. So what are you on about? Cersei says the Red Keep has never fallen and won't today. Jesus Christ, every line of dialogue in this show makes no sense. What do you mean the Red Keep has never fallen? What do you think happened the last time the city was sacked? How do you think your dead husband King Robert became the king? In fact, it was your own father that took the city. And then King Robert that took the Iron Throne. And the Iron Throne is in the Red Keep. That's how you became queen in the first place. The Allied Army and the Lannister Army meet in the city. And there is a clear line drawn between them. Danny lands Drogon on a nearby roof, and the Lannisters throw down their weapons and surrender. We can hear people shouting to ring the bells, and shortly thereafter, they are rung, signifying the surrender of the city and the end of the battle. Danny sits on her dragon, staring at the Red Keep, and seems emotionally distraught. She is visibly crying, and then her tears turn to anger. 
She then flies Drogon towards Cersei. Finally, I thought, the return of logic. Finally, she's going to do something I can actually believe Daenerys would do. Kill Cersei. Then she suddenly decides to start burning innocent people to death in the streets. It's over. Maybe there was a sliver of hope this series could be fixed to a certain degree and give people a decent ending, but that sliver was just destroyed right here. This is the official death of the show. There's no coming back from this. Daenerys burning innocent people alive is something that she just wouldn't do. It's fundamentally at odds with her character and her actions up to this point. And there are some people that actually defend this and even claim to like it. And it's not even like Danny is some great character that I love, and I'm just disappointed they chose to turn her mad. In fact, post season 3, I found the character quite dull and lifeless. And from then up to this point, I found Amelia Clark's performance to be flat and uninspired. Her sudden turn into a regal sounding stereotypical queen character always seemed at odds with her upbringing to me. I always thought she should be almost a polar opposite of Cersei. While Cersei was raised in the lap of luxury, never wanting for anything, and thus had the typical royal manner about her. Conversely, Daenerys grew up in poverty with little help. Her brother was known as the Beggar King, and she was essentially sold off to Khal Drogo. She had a rough upbringing, and I always thought that should be reflected in the way she carried herself as queen. And it did for a time. She was rough around the edges and unafraid to speak her mind, even at the risk of alienating people, because she wasn't properly trained to be royalty, as someone like Cersei would have been. And then somewhere around season 3 or 4, she just turned into a typical queen archetype. Still, in this scene, and much of the final season, Amelia Clarke brought some of that roughness back to her performance. And she did a good job. It's just a shame that the material was so terrible. She claimed to have walked around London for hours after reading the script for this episode, and I can understand why. It's a radical character shift. If the writers wanted Daenerys to become the Mad Queen, that's fine. It could have even been quite interesting, but they needed to earn it. They needed to take their time and properly develop it over the course of at least a season or two. It's reminiscent of the radical change in character Luke Skywalker had in The Last Jedi. In that film, he was a miserable and depressed loner who wanted no part in the fight to save the galaxy, and had shut himself off from the Force and was waiting to die. This was a far cry from the optimistic and hopeful young man that was willing to sacrifice anything to save the ones he loved and redeem his father. A lot of people defended the change in the character as being fresh and new, and some, including the writer-director Ryan Johnson, claimed this shift was actually completely in line with the Luke from the original trilogy. Obviously, this is not true, but it's an interesting argument, and many fans and critics tried to claim the same for Daenerys, and used her past actions as proof. So, let's take a look at Danny's morally dubious actions in seasons past, and see if they make her decision to slaughter innocent people, including children, make sense. In season 1, she stood by and watched as her brother Viserys was killed by Khal Drogo, Afterwards, she calmly proclaimed that Viserys was no dragon, as fire cannot kill a dragon. She seemed rather unmoved by his brutal death. However, Viserys was a frequent abuser of Danny, and even sexual molester. He willingly sold Danny to Drogo for use of his army in order to take the Iron Throne, with no care for what would happen to her. Plus, Viserys had just openly threatened the life of Danny's unborn child. Her actions here are understandable. At the end of Season 1, she straps Miri Mazdur to a large pyre, and has her burned alive. This was after Miri had betrayed Daenerys and left Khal Drogo in a vegetative state and had killed her unborn child in the womb. Again, her actions are somewhat understandable. In Season 2, she has Zaro and Daria sealed inside Zaro's vault after they both betray Daenerys so that Pyat Pri may steal her dragons and Zaro may become King of Karth. Her actions here are once again a reaction to betrayal. In Season 3, she kills the slave owner, whom she buys the Unsullied from. In season 5, she executes a murderer, which ends up being to her detriment, and she kills some slave owners who are conspiring against her. In season 6, she kills some Karls in order to save her own life, prevent them from raping her, and take over the Dothraki. In season 7, she burns Randall and Dickon Tarly alive after they have surrendered to her, which is a morally dubious act to be sure, and in season 8, she executes Varys after she catches him conspiring against her and attempting to have her killed. So has Daenerys done some morally questionable things in the past? Yes. Has she killed some people before? Absolutely. Will she kill people that turn on her or conspire against her? Yes, and she will absolutely roast them with dragonfire. But are there any examples of her killing people that would make her decision to brutally murder tens of thousands of innocent people, including children with Drogon's fire, in keeping with her character? (laughs) Absolutely not. Daenerys has always wanted to save innocent people, and in fact several of the people she has killed, she has done so as retribution for the killing of innocents. When she killed the slave masters, that was after they had murdered hundreds if not thousands of innocent slave children. When she watched Viserys die, it was because he had threatened her child. 
When she killed Mary Mazdur, it was because she had killed her child. Outside of the killing of the Talis, who had surrendered to her, but had simply refused to recognise her as their queen, Daenerys hasn't really done too much that's morally questionable, and certainly not when it came to innocent people, especially children. In fact, there are several examples of her specifically ordering her people to avoid the killing of innocents and children. When she invades Yonkai, she tells Jorah and Dario that she doesn't want to take the city if it means even one innocent person will die. And when Drogon seemingly kills a child with his fire, Daenerys is heartbroken and decides to chain Rhaegal and Viserion in the crypts beneath her castle. She even lets her natural affinity for children nearly get her killed in Season 3, and the rumours, later revealed to be lies, about her dead brother, Rhaegar, having kidnapped and raped Lyanna Stark, disgust her. The series has repeatedly established Daenerys as a flawed person, sure, but a person with above-average moral character as far as Westeros is concerned. She's against rape, against murder, against slavery, and especially against the harming of innocent people and children. And yet we are supposed to believe that the North celebrating Jon more than her, coupled with the fact that Jon is the rightful heir to the Iron Throne, and the death of Masande and the betrayal of Varys, is enough for her to completely snap, fundamentally change her moral philosophy, and murder thousands of innocent people by brutally burning them to death, including indiscriminately murdering children all the while ignoring the actual target she set out to kill, Cersei. Well, I don't buy that for a second. Maybe you could take the character in that direction if you took your time and did it properly over the course of several seasons, and there would have to be some damn fine reasoning behind it too. The idea she did it because of the trauma of losing loved ones like Masande and her dragon Rhaegal isn't good enough. Danny has lost plenty of loved ones in the past, and that never caused her to start murdering children. She's lost Viserys, Drogo, Rhaegar, her blood riders, Doria and Jorah betrayed her, lost Barristan Selmy, Viserion, and finally Jorah, and she still managed to keep a level head. If anything, losing Jorah and Masande and Rhaegal in relatively quick succession should have made her want to kill Cersei and Euron even more. And if she had flown straight for Cersei and destroyed the Red Keep, killing some innocents as collateral damage, that would have been one thing. But she did the one thing that made no sense, either in the moment or for her character. If you want to argue that she snapped mentally, first I'd say, why did she snap in that moment? If the death of Masande was the final straw, why didn't she snap there and just start killing? Or why didn't she start killing as soon as she arrived with Drogon? Why was it this moment, with the bells ringing to signify surrender, that she snapped? And even if you can buy that she snapped here, why wouldn't her first action be to fly straight to Cersei and roast her with Drogon? It just doesn't make sense no matter which way you cut it. If people like it for the visuals or something, that's fine. Maybe people like the idea of Danny turning into the Mad Queen, and I could see a scenario in which that is done correctly, and it could be an interesting turn for her character. But the way in which it was actually done was a complete and utter failure. I also thought it was rather funny that they clearly forgot to CGI Amelia Clarke into some of the shots, because you can clearly see she isn't riding Drogon in some of these scenes where she is burning people to death. Once Daenerys fires up the barbecue, Grey Worm starts murdering the surrendered Lannister soldiers, as Jon watches in shock. Jon meekly attempts to get his men to fall back, but they ignore him, and Jon is forced back into the fight. What on earth are the northern men doing ignoring their commander and king, and following the actions of a foreign leader? I don't believe they would do that for a second. I think they would have all looked at Jon for orders in that situation, and would have done as he commanded. If you want to see just how little attention to detail was paid during the making of this show, look at this. Grey Worm runs right into the middle of a group of Lannister soldiers. He is unarmed because he is running after the spear he just threw at a soldier, which means he is about 10 feet away from his own men, in a sea of enemy soldiers, and is unarmed. Thankfully, they are a very polite enemy, and just decide not to kill him, like they easily could. Jon and his men start killing the Lannisters too, because Jon is too much of an ineffectual leader to stop them. During the battle, a northerner tries to rape a woman, and Jon stops him. So the soldier tries to murder Jon. Who the hell is trying to rape someone in the middle of a battle they are fighting? And even if they are, why would a northern soldier betray Jon and try to kill him because he is ordered not to rape? What nonsense is this? Who wrote this absolute garbage? Danny continues to ignore Cersei because there are still a few innocent people she hasn't brutally burned to death yet. She even flies right past Cersei in the Red Keep and doesn't kill her in favour of murdering more innocents. Imagine actually writing that in your script for the penultimate episode of this series. This is like a parody of Game of Thrones. Euron swims to shore from the ruins of the Iron Fleet, and arrives on the small beach behind the Red Keep, just as Jaime happens to arrive in his attempt to get to Cersei. Boy, what a coincidence. Let's put aside the fact that he managed to swim all the way to shore, 
decked out in all his gear for a second, and ignore the fact that he just happened to get there at the same time as Jamie, and ignore that he doesn't even seem that tired, it's his reaction to seeing Jamie that's the most ludicrous. Jamie asks him for help in saving Cersei, and yet Euron is more interested in fighting Jamie, which is so dumb it even seems to confuse Jamie, the stupidest Lannister. Euron challenges Jamie to a fight. Why would he do that? Not only is King's Landing on fire, but he must be tired from the swim, and most importantly, as far as Euron knows, Cersei is pregnant with his child, which seemed to be a big deal to him when he found out, but suddenly he cares more about killing Jaime than saving his unborn child? Cersei's wine glass is crushed by falling debris, in what I assume is a kind of weak attempt at symbolism, because the writers have spent such little time over the past few seasons developing Cersei, beyond a one-note evil bitch, that that's the best they could come up with, I guess. I mean, what else could they come up with as a form of symbolism for the end of Cersei's reign? All they've had her do is be evil and drink wine. Daenerys then destroys a part of the Red Keep, but not the part where Cersei is, and has been standing on the balcony for the entire battle. It's like they're taunting us with how badly they've screwed this show up. We do see some wildfire explosions throughout the city as Daenerys burns and destroys it, which I did like. It was a nice touch that paid off Jaime's speech in Season 3, in the bathtub, when he explained that the Mad King had placed caches of wildfire underneath the city and at the moment his reign seemed to come to an end, he ordered his pyromancer to ignite the wildfire and burn all of the citizens, which is when Jamie intervened. It was a rare moment of creativity to actually see those caches explode, and it's rather ironic that not only was it the Mad King's daughter that finally ignited them, but that her dragonfire was much more powerful and destructive than the caches. Still, it's something of a shame that Jamie wasn't directly a part of that somehow. Perhaps in an alternate season 8 he could have killed Cersei to prevent the destruction of King's Landing, in an attempt to save the innocent people again, realising the Valonqar prophecy in the process, and then perhaps he could have attempted to prevent Daenerys from burning the city, much like he did with her father decades prior. So Euron stabs Jaime and Jaime kills Euron. Sloppy fight aside, especially when Euron seemingly just gives up and lets Jaime kill him, the worst part is that Euron seems content with his death because he's the man that killed Jaime Lannister. Only no one will ever know that. Euron will die of his wounds, and Jaime is crushed under the falling ceiling. And even if it was clear that Jaime had died of a stab wound, no one else was around to see it. The Hound and Arya arrive in the Red Keep, and he tells her that revenge will make her like him, as revenge is what he has wanted his whole life. It took you until right now to say this to her? Didn't you think to tell her on what must have been a month-long trek down here? He says if she comes with him, she'll die there with him. Arya calls him Sandor for the first time, thanks him, and leaves. Which is a nice touch. Also, Arya probably would have seen the Red Keep collapsing under Daenerys' attack and known that Cersei was doomed and not bothered to go this far anyway. But regardless, it was a nice moment, if oddly timed. The Hound says he has wanted revenge his whole life, and this is presumed to be revenge against his brother the Mountain. Clegane Bowl has been a long-discussed idea, and I'm sure a fight between the Hound and the Mountain was high on a lot of fans' wish lists for this season and yet the entire thing doesn't make much sense. If the Hound wanted revenge on his brother so badly he is willing to walk into a collapsing building and die himself to get it, then why didn't he take his revenge at any point in his life? He's had decades worth of opportunities to get his revenge. And even during the course of Game of Thrones, there's been two interactions between the characters where he could have taken his revenge. The first in Season 1, when he fought the Mountain in defense of Sir Loras Tyrell, and yet he chose to forego revenge when King Robert ordered a stop to the fighting. The man who said, fuck the king in Season 2, found the king's orders more important than his own revenge. The second interaction was in Season 7, in the Dragon Pit in King's Landing, when Jon and company were pointlessly trying to convince Cersei to join the fight against the dead. The Hound came face to face with his brother, and not only did he not attempt to take revenge, but he even acknowledged that the man before him was no longer his brother. Not to mention that in the entire time we have been following the Hound, he hasn't once mentioned a desire to kill his brother before episode 4 of this season, at least as far as I can recall. It seems like the fight between the Hound and the Mountain was a rushed inclusion in order to give some type of surface level fan service to an otherwise miserable season of television. And revenge was used as a justification for the fight to prevent Arya from killing Cersei because Lord knows the ceiling falling on her head was the more satisfying payoff than Arya crossing off one of the first names she put on her list. The Hound starts climbing the stairs and quickly comes across a fleeing Cersei, accompanied by the Queen's Guard, Kyburn, and the Mountain. The roof caves in and several of the Queen's Guard are conveniently killed. The Hound makes quick work of those that are left and the final confrontation between the Hound and the Mountain begins. The Mountain appears to recognise the Hound, implying his turn into a controlled zombie wasn't quite as effective as we've been led to believe. Kyburn attempts to get the Mountain to ignore the Hound and protect the Queen, but the Mountain kills Kyburn with little effort. 
What a fascinating waste of time Kyburn turned out to be. I sure do love my investment in characters being utterly wasted as the writers give me one middle finger after the other as they pointlessly kill them off with no real payoff. Also, the mountain choosing to fight the hound over protecting Cersei, including going so far as to kill the man that made him in order to do so, begs the question, why didn't he pick a fight with the hound back in the dragon pit in season 7? If it was no big deal to him then, why is it of grave importance to him now? Cersei sneaks past them and both the hound and the mountain allow her to leave. She quickly finds Jamie at the bottom of the stairs, and as the Mountain and the Hound begin their fight to the death, Jamie and Cersei head for the beach. The Hound pointlessly stabs the Mountain in the chest several times, even after it becomes clear it isn't doing anything, and the Mountain does the cliché big villain archetype move and pointlessly throws the Hound around, instead of killing him. The Mountain then begins to gouge the Hound's eyes, and I guess the Hound must have stronger eyes than Oberyn, because he is not only able to survive longer, but he is able to stab the mountain in the face in defence. And when the mountain lets go, his eyes don't appear to be too damaged. Certainly not this level anyway. The hound then tackles the mountain through the wall, and they both seemingly fall to their deaths in a fiery pit. I believe the idea was that the hound was overcoming the one fear he had, fire, in order to kill his brother. However, fire is not what killed them. The fall did. The fire would have just badly burned him more on the way down. So I'm not sure the symbolism quite works the way the writers wanted it to. We then follow Arya for about 10 minutes as she tries to escape the collapsing city, and we see Jon finally call a retreat of his soldiers, and suddenly they decide to listen. We see Arya wake up covered in blood and ash, only for the bell tower to begin to collapse. It seems as though it's going to fall on her when the episode cuts to black, and when we cut back, she is fine. Oh, great. This trick again. Returning from its liberal use in episode 3. Arya then tries to flee with a mother and young child. The mother falls, and the child refuses to leave her mother, and the two are burned to death by Daenerys and her dragon. Daenerys wouldn't do that. I'm just throwing that out there again. She just wouldn't. Especially since the road was otherwise empty in that spot. You couldn't even make the argument she burned them by mistake, or as part of a larger pack of people. No, she must have seen that they were an innocent mother and child, and she chose to burn them anyway. She wouldn't do that. The blast of dragon fire is so powerful that Arya seems to have been killed too. When the episode cuts to black. Hmm, I wonder if she'll be alright. Jamie and Cersei are stuck under the Red Keep as the path to the beach has been blocked off by falling debris. It seems clear they are about to die, and yet there is a small gap at the top of the pile of bricks, seemingly lighting the scene. It's hard to say if it's big enough for an adult to squeeze through, but it might be enough of an opening to be able to shift some of the debris and bricks and get through if they tried. Instead, they completely ignore it because the script says they are supposed to die now. Cersei says she doesn't want to die. Then maybe you should have acted logically and killed Daenerys when you had the chance last episode, stupid. Jamie says nothing matters but them. They embrace as the ceiling collapses, seemingly killing them both. We see bricks from the ceiling falling in the background and eventually reaching them. But then in the next episode, when Tyrion wades through the debris to find their bodies, there are no bricks in that area of the room. I guess the set decorator just forgot. What an absolutely pathetic and anticlimactic end for these two characters. Cersei had long since been turned into a one-note villain, but even she deserved a more fitting death than a brick falling on her head. And as for Jaime, what the hell? What were the writers thinking with his character this season? Why fundamentally destroy all that work developing him? I just don't get it. What a disaster his story ended up being. There are so many options for a more poignant and poetic end for their characters, not least of which would have been Jamie killing Cersei in order to save innocent lives, bringing to life the Valonqar prophecy, and requiring Jamie to sacrifice another piece of himself mentally and emotionally, as well as break another oath, this one to the woman he once loved, in order to save the innocent people that will all hate him regardless. It would have actually been a rather nice ending for his character, if he survived, having killed Cersei in an attempt to save the innocent people of King's Landing once again. And yet unlike last time, when doing so got him nothing but distrust and scorn, this time he is recognised for his actions, and treated as a hero by the people. I don't know. I'm sure there are dozens of great ideas people have come up with to conclude the stories of these once great characters. I'd take just about anything other than the roof collapsing on their heads. And what do you know? She's fine once again. Maybe people should just use the cut to black trick in real life and see if that happens. About to be eaten by a shark? Just cut to black and you'll end up safely on the shore. About to die in a disaster in space? Just cut to black. Suddenly Arya sees a white horse. Apparently Harry Strickland's horse. Which has stayed perfectly still during the entire battle, including the death of his owner and the destruction of the wall he's standing near, when a dragon flew through it. Sure. Whatever. So Arya grabs this horse and rides out of the city to safety, even though in the next episode she's just back in King's Landing anyway. I give up. There's no saving this garbage anyway, so who cares anymore? 
And that's that. That's the end of episode five and the end of part two of this critique. Part three will be out soon, hopefully. It will cover episode six, and then the rest of it will cover all of the character arcs, and I'll give my fleshed out ideas as to what I think should have happened this season, as opposed to the absolute garbage we actually got. I hope you liked part two. Thanks for watching, and keep an eye out for part three soon. You have to acknowledge the elephant in the room, which is the boomer generation and its consequences have been a disaster for the human race. This is very good, by the way. Thank you. It's a cafe latte. Mm -hmm. What is that? Milk? Milk. Uh, Milk and coffee. coffee. Milk and coffee. Who would have thought? No, Milk and coffee. Oh want. my God. What a, what a drink. Stunning. What's going on, big guy? How about you? It might be your first ball job. Yeah, of course. How long did it take for the guy to come? Ha, 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 ha.